My guest today is Andy May. Is AR6 the worst and most biased IPCC report? The first IPCC physical science report is called FAR and was first published in 1990. An updated 1992 version of the report contains this statement. Global mean surface air temperature has increased by 0.3 to 0.6 degrees C over the last 100 years. The size of this warming is broadly consistent with the predictions of climate models, but it is also of the same magnitude as natural climate variability. The unequivocal detection of the enhanced greenhouse effect from observations is not likely for a decade or more. This was an accurate statement at the time and mostly accurate to this day. In the past century, since 1920, temperatures have increased about one degree, and I'm not sure we'll be able to detect a human-enhanced greenhouse effect in 10 years or ever, but otherwise the quote is still accurate. One degree of global warming in a century is well within natural climate variability according to historical records of glacier advances and retreats. Glaciers exist today where no glaciers existed during the medieval warm period from about 800 to 1200 AD, and the Holocene climatic optimum from about 7500 to 4500 BC. In addition, the Vikings farmed parts of Greenland where permafrost exists today. Otzi, the Tyrolean ice man who was frozen into a glacier 5,000 years ago and only recently discovered in his glacier tomb, can attest to the fact that modern glaciers are more advanced than they were before 3000 BC. The second report called SAR was published in 1996 and 1997. Chapter 8 was a major issue when it came out because in the original draft, The scientists who wrote it all agreed to include this statement. No study to date has both detected a significant climate change and positively attributed all or part of that change to anthropogenic causes. Yet in the final meeting of the IPCC Supervising Committee of Government Politicians, the editors and lead authors of the IPCC on November 29th, 1995, went very late and into the early morning of November 30th uh, and changed the statement to read, the balance of evidence suggests a discernible human influence on global climate. This change was agreed by the lead authors and political representatives of the participating countries and without consulting the scientists who wrote and approved the final draft of the chapter months earlier. The change caused an uproar in the scientific community with Frederick Seitz, the 17th president of the United States National Academy of Sciences, writing about it in the Wall Street Journal under the headline, A Major Deception on Global Warming. In the article, Seitz says, in my more than 60 years as a member of the American scientific community, including service as president of both the National Academy of Sciences and the American Physical Society, I have never witnessed a more disturbing corruption of the peer review process than the events that led to this IPCC report. He did not choose the word corruption lightly. The third report, TAR, was published in 2001. It was seriously tarnished by the inclusion and promotion of the notorious hockey stick graph that was later shown to be seriously flawed due to major statistical errors and the inclusion of seriously flawed data. Even so, the IPCC (coughs) included the following statement that was based on the flawed hockey stick. In the light of new evidence and taking into account the remaining uncertainties, most of the observed warming over the last 50 years is likely to have been due to the increase in greenhouse gas concentrations. Numerous reports, peer-reviewed articles, most notably by Stephen McIntyre and Ross McKittrick, Edward Wegman, and the U.S. National Research Council, 
detailed the numerous flaws in the graph. Analysis showed that random red noise could be fed into the statistical algorithm that was used to create the hockey stick, and it still produced hockey sticks. The fourth report, AR4, issued this statement. Most of the observed increase in global average temperatures since the mid-20th century is very likely due to the observed increase in anthropogenic greenhouse gas concentrations. This was very much like what was written in TAR, where the same conclusion was based on the now discredited hockey stick. AR4 backed away from the hockey stick, <clears throat> admitting it was flawed, but it also... <clears throat> It also claimed that there was a very high chance that the Himalayan glaciers would melt by 2035. This was an impossibility, it turned out, and the head of the AR4 effort, Rajendra Pachuri, had to back down and apologize for the error. This and other problems with the report led to a UN Inter-Academy Council investigation that found that the IPCC guidelines for their reports had not been followed and that serious bias had crept into AR4. They also found that a full range of peer-reviewed views were not included. AR5 published in 2013 included the following statement. More than half of the observed increase in global mean surface temperature from 1951 to 2010 is very likely due to the observed anthropogenic increase in greenhouse gas concentrations. This is very similar to the conclusions of TAR and AR4, but no new evidence is included in the report. Importantly, John Christie and others had warned the authors of the report that the climate models they were using predicted much more warming in the tropical trophosphere than was observed. Still later, Ross McKittrick and John Christie showed that nearly all the AR5 models predicted too much warming at a statistically significant level, and this excess warming was dubbed the hotspot. The hotspot still exists in AR6 and has gotten worse. It is noticeable, it is notable that if the human greenhouse gas emissions are removed from the climate models, the fictitious hotspot goes away and the models move much closer to observations. In AR6, we read the following. The likely range of human-induced change in global surface temperature in 2010 to 2019 relative to 1850 to 1900 is 0.8 to 1.3 degrees C with a central estimate of 1.07, encompassing the best estimate of observed warming for that period, which is 1.06, with a very likely range of 0.88 to 1.21. While the likely range of the change attributable to natural forcing is only minus 0.1 to plus 0.1. Thus, they now claim that it is likely all the warming since the 19th century is due to humans. And this is despite the fact that in the tropical trophosphere, their climate models are statistically invalidated if they include the human greenhouse gas emissions in the model. They were warned to avoid confirmation bias and that the AR5 models were running too hot. Yet in a AR6, they made the models run even hotter than in AR5, and they ignored dissenting opinions by Richard Lindzen, Roger Peelke Jr., John Christie, Ross McKittrick, and many other prominent climate scientists. Notice the range of AR5 model results do not touch 0.6, yet in AR6 they do. In AR6, notice the coupled ocean atmosphere models, red boxes, produce higher sea surface temperatures than observed, blue boxes. The model observation mismatch in sea surface temperatures in the Pacific Ocean is a very serious problem. Besides sea surface temperatures, the IPCC CMIP climate models have a serious problem with clouds. They cannot model clouds. It is well known and accepted that clouds are net cooling, but how do they respond when surface temperatures rise? What is the net 
feedback of clouds when the world warms. They don't know, and the uncertainty in the cloud response to warming is nearly as large as the total uncertainty in all modeled surface warming feedbacks. We find this in AR6 on the subject. CMIP6 models have a higher mean ECS and TCR, or climate sensitivity to greenhouse gas gases, values than the CM, CMIP5 generation of 50 models. They also have higher mean values and wider spreads than the assessed best estimates and very likely ranges within this AR6 report. These higher ECS and TCR values can in some models be traced to changes in extratropical cloud feedbacks that have emerged from efforts to reduce biases in these clouds compared to satellite observations. <clears throat> the broad Broader ECS and TCR ranges from CMIP6 also lead the models to project a range of future warming that is wider than the assessed warming range. Translation. We adjusted our cloud feedback parameters to try and fix the mismatch with the real world, and when we did that, the already too warm models got worse. They are clearly in that stage of their modeling effort that every time they try and fix a mismatch, they break something else. It's a sign that their models are missing some vital component of climate. The plot on the right is a plot of model climate feedback to model calculated ECS or equilibrium climate sensitivity to a doubling of CO2. Remember, cloud feedback cannot be modeled. It must be input to the model via user adjustable parameters. The plot tells us that 71% of the model computed ECS is determined by these user input parameters. The models can literally produce almost any ECS the modeler desires. As previously mentioned, the IPCC climate models have a hard time with sea surface temperatures. They not only predict higher sea surface temperatures than observed, they also get the pattern of warming and cooling oceans wrong. It seems they have decided their models must be correct, so they have assumed that the feedbacks must be changing, and this has screwed them up. They are fundamentally changing their models such that they cannot be refuted by observations. By hypothesizing a continually changing climate state, they are making their already unfalsifiable ideas even more unfalsifiable. As Karl Marx and his followers found out, if your hypothesis is fluid enough, you can conclude whatever you want and no one can challenge you. So now AR6 claims that as surface temperatures rise, the feedbacks to that warming change. In one fell swoop, they both explain why their models do not match observations, and they invalidate those pesky observation-based calculations of climate sensitivity that are so much less than their model-based estimates. As you can see in the AR6 maps in this slide, the modeled ocean temperatures are much simpler than the observed pattern. Further, the cloud cover over South America is increasing, not decreasing as predicted. The models expect the Eastern Pacific to warm much more than observed, and the Western Pacific is warming much more than predicted. The pattern is wrong. They claim that the models are okay, they just need to adjust their feedbacks. Richard Seeger and his colleagues write, the tropical Pacific Ocean response to rising greenhouse gases impacts all the world's population. State-of-the-art climate models predict that rising greenhouse gases reduce the west-to-east warm-to-cool sea surface temperature gradient across the e equatorial Pacific. In nature, however, the gradient has strengthened in recent decades as Greenhouse gas concentrations have risen sharply. This stark discrepancy between models and observations has troubled the climate research community for two decades. The failure of state-of-the-art models to capture the correct response introduces critical error into their projections of climate change in the many regions sensitive to tropical Pacific sea surface temperatures. End quote. And 
the region sensitive to tropical Pacific temperatures is virtually the entire northern hemisphere. AR6 has its own version of the tar hockey stick, and it is just as flawed as the first one. They also publish a refutation of their own version on page 316 of their report, as shown in this slide. They want us to believe the last decade was warmer than any decade in the past 125,000 years. The data they rely on from 10,000 years ago to 2,000 years ago has only century, 10 decades, resolution by their own admission. I added the red circle arrows and brackets to their figure 2.11. Notice especially the bracket. The uncertainty bars and their plot of temperatures from 10,000 years ago to 2,000 years ago are larger than all the recent warming. In other words, their own data does not support their statement. They can't possibly tell us anything about how the most recent decade compares to any decade prior to around 1850 at the end of the Little Ice Age. I could go on and on, but the bottom line is that AR6 is the worst and most biased IPCC physical science basis report ever. SAR through AR5 were bad, but AR6 is beyond help. Take this from one of the few who has read all of them. It is very clear that the IPCC is losing the public Polls repeatedly show the world population does not believe global warming is a priority. Recent polls show that skepticism about human-caused climate change is increasing all around the world. A recent University of Chicago poll found that belief that humans have caused all or most of climate change has slumped to 49% from 60% just five years ago. 70% of the U.S. public are unwilling to spend more than $2.50 a week to combat climate change. 60% of U.S. voters believe that climate change has become a religion that has nothing to do with climate. Billions of dollars, six major reports that total 6,543 pages, 2,391, uh, or nearly half of them are, are in AR6, and a total of 47 reports of all kinds, and the public has not been convinced that climate change is important. It's time for the IPCC to reform or give up, in my opinion. For more details about the flaws in AR6, read the Clintel Report. It was created by an international team of scientists from seven countries around the world. It has been extensively peer-reviewed by some of the world's top climate scientists. Thank you. Thanks for that presentation. I really enjoyed that. And as I was saying earlier, I've looked at your uh, Intel report online, and it's got tons of great graphics on there. So I encourage people to go out and take a look at that. Let's see. So... Do you think in general then that the IPCC reports have gotten worse, that the first one uh, looked pretty good and then it, things got progressively worse from there? Yes, I think that's true. It does seem to be a steady progression and it seems to be almost entirely due to political influence on the, on the scientists and the selection of the scientists that, that write the reports. Are there any um, skeptical scientists that left in like AR6? I mean, Lindsen was long gone by then, right, in terms of IPCC? Uh, no, I think they've all been excluded. In fact, Roger Peelke Jr. reported that he was told by a, a member of the IPCC that he would never participate in, a, in another IPCC report. And he's one of the most prominent experts in weather and ex extreme weather and weather disasters. So... There, there's this uh, narrative that uh, each time we put out a new IPCC report, we've learned new things that make us even more alarmed. But what do you think about that? Have we learned anything that should make anyone more alarmed since the first report came out? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, nothing that, should, that would make, um, make us more alarmed. That, that part of it is true. Now, we've learned a lot more, but... Um, most of what we've learned has shown that nature plays a larger role than we thought. 
Yeah, I really enjoyed that um, section where you showed the detailed differences between the models and reality. And do you think those are ever going to get resolved? Not with these models. Uh, they have a fundamental flaw, and that is they are not including natural variability as expressed by ocean oscillations. I'm talking about the the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation, the Pacific decadal oscillation. These were all uh, discovered after the CO2 hypothesis was created. And the reason for the title of our report is that they set on this idea that CO2 was causing the warming, and then they have not changed that, even though mountains and mountains of research and evidence uh, has come out since that hypothesis was created. And all the evidence that I know of that has been discovered since 1990 is, leads us to believe that natural climate change is much larger than we thought in 1990. In 1990, I kind of bought into the CO2 idea. Uh, you know, it, you know, it wasn't it wasn't that unusual for scientists to read the first report and go, oh, well, yeah, that makes sense. But then we discovered the AMO, the PDO. We discovered uh, major things about solar variability and changes in the atmospheric climate state that are all described in our report and in Javier Vinos's excellent book. They're way behind the times. Their ideas froze before the real evidence came in. In AR5, it was found that the models were too uh, hot in the tropics, but then things got worse in AR6, or what's the explanation? Why did it get worse? They admitted in the report, they, uh, they increased the cloud feedback from AR5. And when they increased the cloud feedback from AR5, the projected warming got higher by 20%. So it's right there in the report. They admit what they did. And uh, and when they did that, they moved farther away from observations, as, as I showed, uh, with those two slides side by side. So there is a basic assumption that clouds are a positive feedback, but you think it might be negative? Am I right there? Uh, it's unclear. Um, it could be positive or it could be negative. Think about it this way. During the daytime when the sun is out, the, the sunlight is reflected from the tops of the clouds back into space. But at night, the emissions of infrared from the surface of the Earth bounce back towards Earth with those same clouds. So the same cloud can be uh, a negative feedback during the day and a positive feedback at night. <laughs> so it's, it's virtually impossible to tell whether in net they're negative or positive. Okay, and it, it's a day-night thing, and it's uh, where that cloud is on Earth, right? I'm forgetting. I think you told me on a previous podcast. Uh, it depends on if you're in Antarctica or not. What was that? It depends, yeah. In Antarctica, there really aren't any clouds in the wintertime uh, at night. Uh, it's, it's clear skies, so radiation goes straight to space. What happens in the tropics is that clouds that are very high, uh, cirrus clouds, they... They are net warming. I think everybody pretty much agrees with that. The satellite data tells us that. It's the lower level clouds, the clouds that are closer to the surface, that could be either negative or positive because they're warmer. The clouds themselves are warmer, so they emit more radiation to space from the top. And they, uh, so that's where the uncertainty is. Uh, and and I, I don't want to really state an opinion. I, I can tell you this that the overall net climate a cloud effect on climate is negative. That we can tell from, from space. But what, what we don't know is how the clouds react to the warming surface. As the oceans warm, do the clouds increase or decrease? Are they positive, more positive or more negative? So in net, we know they're negative. But the feedback to the surface warming, we don't know. And then uh, I understand that there was some disagreement in your team uh, regarding Chapter 7 about uh, climate sensitivity. You want to talk about that at all? Sure. Uh, yes, the team was divided on Chapter 7. Uh, so 
As a result, we added an appendix to Chapter 7 to show the uh, alternate view. Uh, some of the team believed that most of the warming since the 19th century was due to carbon dioxide. And all this messing about with feedbacks has a small effect on their calculations of uh, climate sensitivity to CO2. That part of the team calculated using observations what the sensitivity to CO2 is, and it came out much smaller than the AR6 estimate. But they still believe that CO2 caused most of that warming, most of that one degree of warming. It's just they don't think it's as sensitive to CO2 as the IPCC does. The other part of the team thinks that natural variability, especially variability in the sun, is probably just as important as CO2. And of course, if that's true, and you take the uh, CO2 estimate from observations, which assumes it's all CO2, and you subtract half of that, then the sensitivity to CO2 is even much smaller. So we all agree the AR6 is too hot. It's just that half of us believe CO2 caused most of the warming and half of us believe the other. Do you have any thoughts on the future of the IPCC? 30 years from now, are they still going to be kicking out reports that are increasingly alarmist and diverge from reality even more? What do you think? I don't know. Um, I mean, it's a waste of money, especially this last report. But I've seen governments waste money my whole life. <laughs> they, they just, they're probably just going to go ahead and, and keep doing it. You know, the, the alarmists that are left in the world today are all politicians and teenagers. So <laughs> it's just <laughs> the scientists, I think, all admit that there's nothing alarming about, our, about global warming. Uh, what is going on now with the comments to the IPCC reports? I think at one point they were put out in the form of PDFs, and I was looking at them. In the most recent uh, time, did they come out in any way that the public could read all the comments? Or I happened? don't know about the public. Uh, I saw all the comments before the report came out. Uh, they were in a, an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, I, I could send it to you. I don't know if it was publicly available or not, but... but uh, they should publish them. I mean, they're they're really good. I I was particularly impressed with Ross McKittrick's comments. Uh, he made a lot of really good ones. Yeah, I thought that slide you put up was very good about how 36 authors signed off on a, a, a certain statement and then it was completely changed. I forget which report that was. Uh, Sorry. How, how can they get away with those shenanigans? It's pretty amazing. How can they? I, d I didn't think they would get away with it at the time. And that was that was a turning point. That was when many, many scientists turned against the IPCC. Uh, you know, most of us thought the first report was pretty good, but the second report was horrible. And uh, and you had the president of uh, the National Research Council call it, you know, practically an abomination. So, but the politicians pushed ahead anyway, and, and the public forgot. I, I don't get it. Like I said, I'm going to tweet out some of the, uh, those graphs. There's a lot of good stuff in that report, so thanks for doing that. Please do, and thank you. Okay. All right. Talk to you later. Goodbye. Sure. Bye-bye.